I'm Chancellor Danov. I'm Lucy Martin. I'm Shania Fernandez. And I'm Stella Lee. Welcome to today's presentation on surgical site infections. Surgical site infections are infections that occur after a surgical procedure in the part of the body where the surgery took place. It is one of the most important but preventable causes of all healthcare associated infections, where in the US, 500,000 of 27 million people undergoing surgery will acquire a nosocomial SSI. In Australia, infection of the surgical site occurs in approximately 3% of surgical procedures, putting every patient who undergoes surgery at risk of acquiring an infection. Complications of surgical site infections include patients staying longer in hospitals, which can burden additional healthcare costs, possibilities of the infection progressing to septicemia and bacteremia if left untreated, and finally, increased morbidity and mortality as some cases can become fatal. Research shows patients with SSIs are twice as likely to die and 60% more likely to be admitted into the ICU. The causes of SSIs can be both endogenous and exogenous. However, most SSIs are caused by the patient's own bacterial flora, such that when the organ is opened, the bacteria from inside has a higher chance of contaminating other tissues. The symptoms of surgical site infections may include redness, delayed healing, fever, pain, tenderness, warmth or swelling. A superficial incisional SSI may also produce pus from the wound site. Surgical site infections can be classified into three types. There are superficial incisional infections, which involves the area of the skin just below the incision, deep incisional infections, which involve deep soft tissues, such as vascular and muscle layers, and finally, organ and space infections, which can involve any part of the body that has been manipulated during the operation. Going back to one of the complications from earlier on, Bacteremia and septicemia are one of the more severe adverse effects of surgical site infections. Although they are very similar, bacteremia is described as the presence of bacteria in the blood at low and intermittent concentrations, and septicemia is where there are significant amounts of bacteria that have invaded the bloodstream. Furthermore, septicemia can lead to sepsis, which is usually a fatal reaction resulting in death. So today our case study involved a surgical site infection and we will be discussing how we go about identifying the causative organism and treating the infection. We have a 52 year old female patient who was in the surgical ward recovering from an abdominal surgery. We can assume that the surgical site was inflamed and had pus, evidence that the patient was experiencing an infection. So the following specimens were collected. Blood culture, wound swab and a nose swab. From the specimens collected, various tests are run to identify the cause of the infection. So some of the main tests we use in the identification of microorganisms are as follows. Culture. This is the first thing that is done, which involves the streaking of the specimen onto agar plates. The standard agar plates used are HBA, McConkey agar and anaerobic HBA. Uh, these plates identify features such as hemolysis, lactose fermentation and growth conditions. Gram stain. This is the staining of an actual specimen or an isolated organism to classify the bacteria based on its cell wall constituents and shape. The groups include gram-negative rod, gram-positive rod, gram-positive cocci, and gram-negative cocci. The catalase and oxidase tests are rapid biochemical tests which detect the presence of specific enzymes within the organism. These tests results used in combination provide a good indication about the identity of an organism. However, further tests are often used to confirm the identification. This may include API strips, DNA plates, or coagulase tests. Sensitivities refer to antibiotic testing, which determine what drugs can be used in treatment. Throughout this process, all tests and results are documented onto a laboratory report from which the main findings are conveyed on a doctor's report. On day zero, the day we received the specimen, we set up different tests depending on the specimen type. In this case, the blood cultures were immediately incubated to allow for the detection of bacterial growth. A direct gram stain was performed from the wound swab itself. The wound and nose swabs were then streaked onto agar plates, being HBA, McConkey agar, and anaerobic HBA, which were then incubated. The only results that were able to be obtained on day zero was the gram stain of the wound swab, which showed gram-negative rods, polymorphonuclear cells, and pus. 
On day one, the blood cultures were positive for bacterial growth, detected by an increase in pH and CO2 concentration. A gram stain was conducted from the blood cultures and then streaked onto the same agar plates mentioned earlier. On the same day, the agar plates for the swab samples are ready for examination. A gram stain and rapid biochemical tests are then conducted from isolated colonies. Based on those results, further tests as well as sensitivities are set up. The gram stain of the blood culture showed two different gram negative rods. When observing the plates from the wound swab, growth was seen on both the aerobic and anaerobic horse blood agar plates, with both indicating gamma hemolysis, although the growth on the anaerobic plate was less than that of the aerobic. However, the McConkie plate displayed similar growth to the aerobic HBA plate and indicated lactose fermentation. These growth patterns are consistent with the growth patterns of Enterobacteriaceae as well as the catalase and oxidase results which returned positive and negative respectively. Looking at the plates from the nose swab, the growth patterns were similar with the anaerobic plate having less growth than the aerobic, while the MAC plate showed similar growth. The blood agar plates, however, displayed beta hemolysis and the MAC plate also showed lactose fermentation. The gram stain was gram positive cocci with clusters of perfect spheres. Furthermore, catalase positive and oxidase negative results were obtained for this organism. The coagulase test also came back positive. On day two, agar plates set up from the blood cultures are ready for examination. Similar to day one, a gram stain and rapid biochemical tests would be conducted, from which further tests and sensitivities are set up. At this stage, the results obtained from the swab samples can identify the causative organism. The aerobic plate from the blood culture showed gamma hemolysis and the MAC plate showed lactose fermentation. However, the anaerobic HPA plate showed growth for two different organisms. This was an indication that there were two organisms present in the blood culture, with one of them being an obligate anaerobe. Both of these organisms also displayed gamma hemolysis. Further tests showed a positive catalase and negative oxidase results for both of the organisms. Results from day two also included the identification of the organisms found in the wound and nose swab. The API 20E that was set up for the wound swab was indicative of Escherichia coli. This organism also appeared to be sensitive to ampicillin, nofloxacin, gentamicin, imipenem, and cafotaxine. The DNA's plate set up from the organism isolated from the nose swab provided positive results, confirming the organism to be Staphylococcus aureus. On the final day, based on the further tests in conjunction with earlier findings, we would be able to identify the causative organism present within the blood cultures. The final day provided the identification of the organisms found within the blood culture. An API 20E was set up for the facultative anaerobe and the presence of Escherichia coli was also confirmed in the blood, showing the same sensitivities from the colonies that had been isolated from the wound swab. The strict anaerobe was inoculated into an API 20A, which resulted in the identification of Bactroids fragilis. This organism was sensitive to metronidazole. Here we have summarised up the characteristics of E. coli, B. fragilis and S. aureus that was isolated from our different specimens. All these results were obtained during the identification process of these organisms. We wrote up a lab report with all of our findings and summarised that into a doctor's report to submit to the doctor. Considering all of this information, we can confirm that the patient has developed an endogenous surgical site infection. This has been caused by an incision into either the deep soft tissue or the organ space during the patient's surgery. From the blood and wound swabs, we know that following this incision, Bacteroids fragilis and Escherichia coli, both known to be commensal bacteria in the gut, have then entered into the bloodstream, deeming both bacteria pathogenic and therefore infecting the surgical site. The samples received were not contaminated with other bacteria and all samples received were relevant to the case. We can assume that the nose swab was taken as Staphylococcus aureus is often the cause of surgical site infections. If found in the nose swab, it would give a clear explanation as to how Staphylococcus aureus could have caused this infection. However, as it was not isolated from the wound, it is not useful and therefore no further testing should be done with this sample. In regards to the treatment of this patient, the most suitable antibiotic to be administered is imipenem. This is the only antibiotic we found to be sensitive to both Escherichia coli and Bacteroids fragilis and therefore is deemed most ideal. However, further sensitivity testing on these particular strains should be carried out in order to confirm effectiveness, otherwise a combination of sensi sensitive antibiotics may be useful. 
In addition to antibiotic treatment, the patient must be monitored as it is very common for an abscess to form after the infection. If so, secondary surgery to remove this may be required. One of the major factors in preventing surgical site infections is the appropriate use of antimicrobial prophylaxis to ensure maximum efficiency. This can be done by choosing the appropriate agent, proper timing of antimicrobial before incision, and limiting the duration of antimicrobial administration after surgery to prevent resistance. Further preventative measures include cautious medical procedure to avoid opening different organs and areas that could contaminate the surgical site. The surgical environment and tools need to be sterilised in order to speed up the healing process. This would shorten the time the wound is exposed to other areas of the body, preventing commensal bacteria entering the surgical site and becoming pathogenic, as seen in this case. Therefore, implementing all of these measures will reduce the occurrence of surgical site infections in the future. This concludes our presentation. Thank you for joining us.